Well, hello everybody out there in Facebook land. Uh, welcome to Hump Day Wednesday here in our incredibly beautiful Duke City. Uh, the weather is amazing today, so I hope you all get a chance to get out, get some of that healthy sun on you today. Um, so welcome to our Wednesday webinar series. Uh, June is sponsored, thank you in part to Comcast. Uh, not only are they our June webinar partners, but Comcast is our huge, huge anchor partner here at the Albuquerque Espano Chamber of Commerce and they do so much for us and next Monday we actually get to spend an hour with the team the Comcast team um, in hearing all about the different things they're doing for small business and also really excited to share with you guys a little bit about some of the things that uh, Comcast has done for us over the years so we want to thank uh, Julianne and team over at uh, the Comcast uh, group we're very excited so thank you again to them also want to thank our partners at New Mexico Tech. Um, there's so many to thank, but Carlos Romero, who we started this program with, who is on our board, that has led to Matthew, that led to Liam, that led to Shay, and I think Gabriel's behind the scenes today joining us. So it's an incredible team, our technology team that really helps us uh, maintain our, uh, our live stream and our uh, <clears throat> Zoom with you guys and records all of this so that we can share it to you guys um, on our website. So if you happen to miss any of the webinars or any bit of today, and I'll repeat this at the end again, you can find every webinar at our website, www.ahcnm.org. Uh, you can click on the COVID link up top and it'll say small business seminars, click on the Comcast series um, in particular for the month of June, and you'll see that. And I think we had New Mexico Mutual and Square. We've had several over the past few months in the series. So this month, we're talking about economic business recovery and those things that are really important to helping small businesses reopen and and really open, you know, healthy and and hopefully in in, uh, in a way that they can help to rebuild and sustain what they already have. Because right now the small business community is suffering in so many different ways, including supplies and PPE. And are their employees outfitted right? Are they trained correctly? I mean, we could go on and on. So today <clears throat> we actually picked a topic that we thought would be um, something that we've not really tackled before, but extremely important um, anytime in in the world, but especially right now. And so our topic today is uh, mental health and mental health awareness and the importance of um, how we balance that with you know, running a business, running a family and finding that healthy work-life balance. So I'm excited to have a couple of great guests with us today. So I would love for them to introduce themselves. And I'm gonna start to my left with Miss Teresa. Tell us all about you and what you do and who you're with. Hi, so I'm Teresa Garcia. Um, I am with the New Mexico Coalition Against Domestic Violence. I'm the Communication, Education, and Outreach Coordinator. So I do quite a bit. I do social media. I am the grant manager for the Allstate Program, which is a financial empowerment. We have three amazing organizations that take part in that, Enlace, DVRC, and CAV in Taos. Um, I do our website, I do communications, and I have recently taken on a lot of the trainings. Um, so that's something new for me that has been actually pretty amazing and a lot of fun. And so I do the trainings for the coalition and for the state of New Mexico. Um, so yeah, that's been fun. And then um, Rachel is actually my boss. <laughs> oh, well, then let, Rachel should have gone first. Excuse me, Rachel. Oh. I I'm learning a lot from Terry, so. <laughs> um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Shannon, for prioritizing a conversation like this for our communities. It's um, such important leadership, you know, to take on this kind of a conversation. So really, thank you so much for thinking to include us today. Um, I'm, I'm newly with the coalition. Uh, I'm in the position of chief programs officer, which really is providing technical assistance and capacity building to all of our domestic violence programs around the state. Um, just prior to when, um, COVID was really hitting in our state. Um, I was, I've worked for 10 years um, at Community Against Violence in Taos, the, the local program here as the clinical director and as, an, a, as a child and adult therapist and also an advocate. And so um, while I'm not with you all in Albuquerque, um, I, my, and my knowledge and community um, is from up here in Taos. Um, but I think a lot of the issues, you know, are very similar when we're talking about just the human experience right now, you know, in terms of what people are going through. And we, when I was with that nonprofit, 
always relied and benefited so much from our relationship with our chamber up here. And so thank you for all of you for, for, the, for the connections you're willing to have with each other and the ways um, that it makes our community stronger. So I'm glad to be with you all today. So I'm so glad that you brought that up, Rachel, because, you know, it, it doesn't really matter where you're at in New Mexico. New Mexico itself is a really unique culture. And, you know, part of what we do here at the Hispano Chamber, uh, you know, and, and we're, nation, we're, we're, we're mostly city and, and statewide, but we have we have members, you know, around the country. We even have international members um, that that help to build, you know, our organization. But you know, New Mexico is a culture unique unto itself. And recently, we hosted the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, which was a huge honor. And uh, we did that um, uh, every year. They they do their national conference, and they chose Albuquerque. Um, and did you know that to this day, this was I believe September of last year, October. I can't remember the exact date. Um, and to this day, we still have people because we're doing a lot of zoom now with COVID and we're reaching out actually staying in more contact with the people that we probably wouldn't normally and they are all still saying wow Albuquerque New Mexico what a culture you guys don't have six degrees of separation you know the, the problems that you have in your larger cities are the same concerns that you have in your smaller cities and it's such a unique um, environment a unique culture so I'm so glad you brought that up that your your uh, you know your work comes from Taos um, I have family in Taos I happen to love Taos um, but it is true it is true the way that we interact is really similar so I think what we learned today it doesn't matter where you are it applies to all of our all of our state and all of our our communities. So I'm really excited to start the conversation. So we all know that COVID has really changed the way that we live our lives from our communication to our technology, um, to our, our medical and healthcare and how we now, you know, work, do that. I mean, it's like telehealth. Who's, who's, who knew that before three months ago? And now we have the, the, you know, this in the forefront, this mental health um, issue that we have, and it is an issue and it is a huge concern. So Rachel, I'd love for you to start us off and tell us a little bit about, you know, the, you know, there's so many questions surrounding this, but I think that the, the core question is, you know, um, what has changed so much um, in the last three months that this has become such a, a topic that needs to be discussed? And also what are some of the, some of the signs, what are some of the things that we should be looking for you know, people have been at home a lot the last three months. So I just want to just want to start the conversation. Sure. Um, thank you for that. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that people were impressed by what they saw and experienced in Albuquerque, for sure. Um, so, um, you know, I think one of the things that has really hit, and I hear it into conversations in community and with other organizations that we're working with, is that you know, the, the living in what feels like really constant uncertainty. And, you know, like when we're, if you're a small business, if you're a nonprofit, or even like what you said, just your family, we're constantly planning for how we're going to be managing our futures. And in this context, it's very hard to do that with any certainty. What's important I think is to recognize is that things were always changing before, you know, like the, the certainty of the future is always a little unknown to us, but there's nothing like this experience to put a really fine point on that. And then when you're also the economic uncertainty, the uncertainty of you know, school for your children, I mean, just so many pieces. Um, and so I think what we're seeing in all of us is each of our own individual capacity to, to manage that sense of uncertainty. I think you see a lot of resiliency during this time where people are kind of just jumping in and they might not know what the future will be, but they know they have to get through it together. So there's a lot of banding together, a lot of taking care of each other. Um, you know, solving these, these feelings of isolation and anxiety by really reaching out, you know, but I think then there's also those of us who when we are experiencing that fear or that uncertainty, we kind of just go into this shutting down mode, you know, where it's really actually hard to reach out. Um, so then for those of us who might have that resiliency during a crisis like this, it can be on us to really be like, you know, going to those doors, knocking on people's doors, all masked up with your hand sanitizer, of course. Um, but, you know, like really, you know, life, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, that, that we, uh, that, that, that I think it's important that there's those of us who are really able to say, hey, I'm really struggling here. I don't know what to do. And then there's those of us who struggle to ask for that help. And so what I think we can do as you know, responsible community members is just assume everybody needs some kind of help right now. You know, like if that's just like a, hey, I see you, you're doing great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if that's just a little pick me up or if that's like, a, you know what, I got a little extra and I'm going to spread it out. Do you need it? You know, however we take care of each other and recognize it, 
one of the things, Shannon, I think that's so important is doing what you have done today is by simply saying, this is something we need to talk about. I think one of the things that can happen sometimes when, when we go in, like one of the responses to stressful situations is avoidance. You know, we want to like, kind of be like, um, you know, just deny it into, into thinking that maybe this will pass or something will, will get better. And I think that, um, then we're living in these like imagined futures that, that, that can be very anxiety ridden versus just talking about it and, and being with each other talking about it as much as possible. And so, um, and I think sometimes people have like, a, let's say a business owner, they can worry like if I bring this up, is it gonna be overwhelming? Maybe it's, you know, rude or inappropriate for me to ask, you know, we're talking about mental health, the work that Terry and I do, Teresa and I do, is also work with domestic violence. And so that can feel very private for people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when we think about the harm of maybe feeling like it offended someone versus the harm of like really not being able to help someone get safe, it's important to kind of think those things through. So, it, you know, do we want to like cause a little, you know, maybe uh, be uncomfortable in the short run versus reaching out? So I, I think you you brought up a couple of really important things, and I, I think one of them is super important that um, we definitely should expand on a little bit is, you know, as an employer, um, a leader, a, a manager, whatever your your title may be, um, but a decision maker within your organization, um, you know, we, we talk about that is a little the, the topic can be daunting because it, are are you intruding? Are, is it getting too personal? Is it you know faux pas? Should we not be discussing this? Is it private? Or is there in, are we infringing on medical rights here? I mean, there's all these different questions that surround it. And I would like to say um, for the record, you know, we just a couple of weeks ago, um, New Mexico Mutual was our sponsor uh, last month's webinar series, and we had uh, uh, several uh, of the of the series dedicated to um, the talk of you know medical marijuana, marijuana in the workplace. And I bring that up because those are conversations that have to be had. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're for it or against it. It's a conversation that has to be had. And it's the same thing with the health and mental health and awareness of your employees, your staff, and the people that depend on you. And we have to figure out to talk about it, how we talk about it, what's appropriate. And so this is, that's why this is important because if I have somebody, if I walk into the office and I see somebody not in a good mood, or maybe I heard something, you know, through, through the, through another employee that says, Hey, you might want to check on them. You know, we need to know it's okay to go to that employee and offer them some sort of, of um, maybe it's, it's a, a phone number to call somebody, or maybe it's a conversation um, that, they, that they feel comfortable in having. So that's why um, that conversation is so important. And so I know that you guys do a lot of stuff where you're at, and I know in particularly the focus is domestic violence. And I do want to get into that a little bit um, in just a bit, because I want to talk about, I can only imagine what COVID has done to that. So I want to kind of talk about that a little bit. But before we do, you guys do offer, and I don't know all the logistics, so Trace, if you can kind of walk us through this a little bit you guys offer classes and i know you train the trainer if you will but you also do have some classes that are open to the public so share with us a little bit about some of those classes and and then how they help also you know how they're helping in this mental health um field so we do quite a bit of training um we do cover like i stated before uh the trainings are for all our 32 organizations across the state but also our trainings are open to the public we do have tickets that are available to you guys um, for any community professionals that would like to, you know, get more awareness to domestic violence, what's happening. Um, and recently when I took over the, the training, I, um, I worked with my staff and asking them, you know, what kind of training should we bring because of this pandemic? Um, what is going on right now that, you know, can become of interest? And so with working together with Rachel and the staff, um, we have done a few trainings, um, and, uh, Kristen Carmichael is one of them that she's done quite a bit for us. So we do protecting frontline staff from burnout. So with COVID-19, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of in, you know, you're stressed. There's a lot of incoming calls. Things are fluctuating. You know, your, your workload is different. Um, so we've done that, um, and just building re resiliency with your staff and, you know, stamina for the road ahead and to protecting yourself. Um, we've also done telehealth done right. Obviously, we cannot do things in person anymore. Everything is via webinar or via phone call. And so that is a different thing that we have 
um, adjust, have been adapting to, should I say, um, as a whole, even for us at the coalition, you know, we do Zoom staff meetings, but now it's been like on a consistent basis. We have so many, so many conference calls throughout the day. And so that can be overwhelming, but the telehealth done right has been also amazing and how to better integrate, you know, the telehealth programs, how to do it safely, especially with privacy. Um, because we not only do deal with, um, you know, with advocates and with clients, but we also do batterers intervention programs. So we need privacy in that aspect, especially since it's at home. And one of the um, recently we did um, making critical decision and challenging times training. Um, so that's, that's a good one because it, it, it's a, it's a webinar that creates unity within your staff. So um, creating ways to earn trust and support your employees um, as founders or community partners, that has been fantastic. Um, that is also, again, these are open to the public. And then the most recent one that we had for the advocates, which actually turned out to be pretty great was with um, our trainer, Jill Davies, um, which is Connect, Offer, um, and what was the- Listen. There you go. Yes, that. And so that was really great because all the advocates came together. They were able to communicate with each other on what's happening. And so we're going to be doing that more on a daily basis. But um, the trainings that we've done are really trying to stay ahead of the curve and how to support our advocates and our community um, on how to adapt with all with all the stress that's going on with COVID-19 and all the, you know, this chaotic time right now with Black Lives Matter and how to support it and how to, you know, just create unity within our community and be there for them. So, so you brought up so many points. So I want to try to tackle them a little at a time. And what I really want to do is I want to understand and I want the public and the community that's watching to understand your organization. So let's talk a little bit about, um, so you, you spoke about, you know, the 30 some or 40 some, um, I believe community partners that you have throughout the state. And then we also talked about um, your, your advocates or your trainers. So let's, let's kind of break down the, the, um, the organization a little bit. And so Rachel, I'm gonna go back to you um, to start us off on this. Tell us a little bit about the organization, how it, you know, how it came to be that kind of info and then help us understand about those community partners. How, what does that um, entail? And if somebody wanted to be part of that, how does that work? Sure. Um, thanks for that. Uh, so I think it's important to know. So the New Mexico Coalition Against Domestic Violence um, is really made up of our membership, which are all of the domestic violence programs, the 32 throughout the state. Um, and some of those are shelter-based programs in your communities. Some of those are people, you know, programs with just out of shelter services, but all responding to people who are needing support resources um, because of their experience of domestic violence. So many of them have services for people who have experienced the domestic violence. And a lot of them also have services for people who are causing harm in our communities, trying to give them the education and resources that they might need to make different choices in their families. Um, and so the work that we do to, is really to support that work locally in communities. So if it's providing the training that Teresa's talking about, if it's around different policy initiatives, you know, looking at different changes to law or initiatives in law in our, in our state legislature, those kinds of things. Um, and really also providing um, any resources that the programs would need to be really as strong as they can for our communities. Um, many of them serve very rural communities um, you know, where people are, even if we, even if there's a, you know, a, that resource, um, people are driving many hours to get to it. Sometimes they operate hotlines. Um, if you're not familiar with the agency that's closest to you or in your community, you could absolutely reach out to the coalition or it's on our webpage. Um, uh, the, it's nmcadv.org. Um, we'd love to get you any resources that you can, because I think during this time, you know, whether or not, kind of like what you were saying, Shannon, like whether or not someone's really comfortable asking those questions, we all should work to be comfortable at least making resources available at our organization. If it's just a place where we have pamphlets or anything like that, um, you know, that this is a time where if it's around economic resources for our staff or, you know, mental health or other kinds of supports, childcare supports, because many people are, are opening their businesses at a pace where the childcare resources aren't really keeping up with that for folks. Um, and so, you know, just any of those resources were available and could certainly help link you to it if it's not obvious for you and your community. 
So let's one more time. What is the what is the website? We're going to go ahead and post that um, up on this uh, strand so that it's there a couple of times. Uh, one more time. What's the website? So it's nmcadv.org. So it's like New Mexico Coalition Against Domestic Violence, nmcadv.org. Um, and I think, you know, there's a whole lot of resources on there. Also, if, if you're a business owner working at a business that this conversation is sparking something for you, there is a whole lot of other resources on that website as well. It's not just how to find your local DV provider. If it's um, other kinds of training, like what Terry, what Teresa was talking about. Um, uh, so I think we could, you know, we'd love to be a resource in any way if people are trying to think through how do I support my staff, we get all kinds of calls we're not a direct service provider we support the direct service providers, but we get a lot of calls just sort of looking at how do I find this, what do I do about this and we can help link you to with the resources that could be helpful. So I'm glad you brought that up, Rachel. That's perfect. Maybe, um, Teresa, you could just quickly take us through what are some of the resources that we can find on your website? Tell us a little bit about the website and what is some of the information that we can find on there? Um, so the website has quite a, a bit of information. You can find um, you know, resources and all our organizations on there, which we have our principal members, which give direct um, services to survivors. We have our organizational list. So those are supporters of domestic violence um, that either give um, part, you know, resources to survivors or just um, support what we do as a coalition. And um, you'll also find all the news, everything that we've been on, uh, media, all the updates, legislative work that we've done. What that's class schedules. Like. I'm sorry? The class schedules. Yes, we also have our training list, our website where you can go in and look at what we have. Um, it has a drop down menu where you can look at upcoming trainings and trainings that we've had previously. Um, there's so much information on there that if you guys have any questions, that is the go-to. We are we try to put as many information, as much information as we can in regards to our services as well, like contact, phone number, address, you know, things like that, and then even their website, so you can click on it and go to their page if you're a survivor of domestic violence. That is absolutely the best resource. Um, you know, just trying to keep up with that with the website, trying to add as much information as we can. Oh, well, we know about keeping on top of the website. Let me tell you, We're, we have one of those websites where everything's on there. It's crazy. But uh, the more informative it is, the better. Somebody's going to be, you know, uh, piddling around on the website and go, oh, I didn't know they did that or, oh, I need that. So that's really awesome. And I hope that everybody goes to that website, even if you're not in necessarily in need of those specific services. There's other things that you're going to be able to find on there. So speaking of those specific services, now I know um, for a fact that, um, you know, I, we we read a lot around here. We're kind of up to date with what's happening around the community as much as possible. We subscribe to uh, hundreds of different either periodicals or articles or online um, uh, places that send us uh, online sites that send us information. And I know that being at home over the last three months with our shelter in place and most businesses, a lot of businesses, uh, the larger corporations, government, people that can work from home still working from home or at home on furlough. So let's talk a little bit about that topic that, you know, is that tough topic to talk about. And Rachel, I'll, I'll uh, start over with you. Um, tell us a little bit about what are some of the numbers that you have seen in the last three months. Um, and let's talk a little bit about why those why those numbers are there and how do we start to fix that? How do we start to solve those those problems for the for the people in the community that are affected by DV? Thank you for that. Um, and again, it's a hard conversation to have. So I think any of us if we can just increase our willingness to kind of to look at it, we'll start to realize how many people in our communities are really impacted by this in some way. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, people chiming into this conversation, um, thanks for hanging in there because it's it's not something we all always talk about and it, it can be a challenge. So, um, but it's so important right now, especially in the context that we're living in because really the, the numbers that you're talking about they can differ from community to community, from Las Cruces to Alamogordo to Farmington, um, but they're going up. You know, um, I think that that um, there was a period of time where everybody kind of just went in in into their homes. They weren't sure if we were open, those kinds of things. So we were trying to do a big push. You know, that shelters and domestic violence services are absolutely essential services and have been open and are staying open. 
It might look a little different in terms of, you know, also managing the public health crisis that we're in, but they are just doing their absolute best. Um, you know, it's really phenomenal the work that they just hit the ground running in with around the state. Um, so they're, they're open and they're seeing an increased numbers for orders of protection. Um, we're seeing an increased number of crisis calls. We're also seeing an increased number in people um, in different parts. Again, this is different, different part, communities experience it in different ways, but there are some communities that are seeing a big increase in people accessing um, their classes and services and case management for people who are perpetrating the violence. Um, and so, which I, I think is really positive, you know, because it's hard to keep putting our, our hotline out there when we know that sometimes people won't be able to call because they're stuck at home and can't access that resource. But we are seeing in different communities an increase also in people getting services um, for, for people who are perpetrating violence, which is really where we want to be focusing a lot of our efforts anyways. Um, and so I think, you know, um, I think this is a time with added stressors, you know, whether or not um, a family has been experiencing domestic violence for a long time. We're seeing a lot of the risk factors for domestic violence, and we're not seeing as many protective factors right now. You know, like for children going to school, having a positive role model in an adult, you know, in there, like those kinds of things that can happen. Um, so, without knowing the exact, you know, number, we, we, we're hearing from programs that it's increasing, and we can assume, you know, that without these other sort of protective um, factors and with people having economic insecurity, these things don't cause domestic violence, but the stressors in that kind of pressure cooker can really add up. Um, so I think, you know, again, I like to think this time, there's that principle in healthcare around universal precaution, you know, like where, where we treat, you know, blood or a person, you know, like just carefully with the, with the idea that they might have something that we don't know about because we can't see it. I think trauma is a really interesting way to use that same principle. We all have experienced something in our lives, whether or not it's current, and we can start interacting with, the, with each other um, from that place, from that assumption. We don't have to know the nitty gritty of our employees' lives to know that this is a hard time, you know, that they might have had stress in their relationship, that there's the, the parenting and the, you know, be, be, being you know, working at an organization and then also being your child's teacher and all of those things that have come together, it's hard. So I think um, the more we can operate from just, you know, that place, I think can be really helpful right now. So again, um, lots of really great information. I had to mute because my, I forgot to turn my phone off and it's far away. <laughs> so I'm like, it keeps ringing. I'm like, mute, I'm sorry. Um, I was running a little bit late to the meeting today. So. Um, but no, I, I think that what, what's super important is that, <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of the misconceptions that happen out there um, have a lot to do with just the, the lack of knowledge or information. And if you're not in a, a DV situation or have never been in that situation in your life, you're not always familiar with that. So I'd like to just take a second to talk about the fact that, you know, domestic violence is not always a husband and a wife or a boyfriend and a girlfriend. It can happen in many different ways. And so the support out there, I mean, it could be a parent and a child or a si siblings or what have you. So Teresa, maybe you could walk us through that a little bit. You know, um, I, again, I think people see DV and they think, oh, you know, it's a husband, it's a wife, and it's just, it's not, and now that we're all like this in our homes, and we're all together, and, and, um, you know, sometimes, you know, the kids drive you crazy, and, and, and then sometimes your parents drive you crazy, and, and, and that's just all fun, and that's just family, but sometimes there's serious issues um, amongst that, and it's not always what we traditionally would think of DV, so Teresa, tell us a little bit about that, and walk us through those, those family scenarios. So right now with COVID-19, it has been, you know, for it's the statement for COVID-19 is stay at home, shelter in place, you're safe, right? Um, but unfortunately for survivors of domestic violence, that is just not the case. Um, from what I recall, um, our director addressing, um, a, I think a couple of weeks ago when this began, I think there was like, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel, I think it was a 78 to 80% increase in domestic violence. And so that itself is absolutely alarming. And domestic violence, unfortunately, like you said, Shannon, it's not just a husband and wife. It can be your boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, it could be a friend. Um, it could be somebody that's close to you. Um, even happens with children, unfortunately, right now with school not being in session. Um, that child is at home with 
either one parent or both parents that can possibly be abusive and their only time that they got away from that or got a break from that or felt safe was going to school and so right now it, that's just not an option and it's the same thing with women and men um, that are experiencing domestic violence in that they're at they're stuck at home right now with that perpetrator and so home is not safe it is not um they just don't not the sanctuary that yeah not that that safe thing you know and being safe from COVID-19 and then you know but you're just not safe at home and so it comes across in so many different shapes and forms and just to be clarified domestic violence is not just physical it is mental psychological mm -hmm. financial um you know emotional I mean you name it it comes in so many different levels that um it's not just physical. Well, and I think that's important. Rachel brought that up a, a few minutes ago when she was speaking was that there's stressors, there's, there's, um, you know, action points that set off the, the behavior. I mean, it, it's, you know, finances right now are a huge problem. I mean, there's so many people that either got laid off and, and have to take, uh, you know, an unemployment, which is probably less than they were making in some cases more, but in a lot of cases less. And then you also have the, the, you know, you have parents that have to stay home now and take care of their kids and, and maybe possibly homeschool. So, you know, you're going back to one income households. So finances can be a, a huge stressor. Um, Rachel, let's go back to that for a few. What are some of the other things that we talked about that are stressors that maybe um, people that are watching and hearing can think, wait a minute, how do I react to that stressor without realizing that could be a stressor that sets off uh, behavior uh, for someone? Sure. I, you know, I think that... Um... You know, when, especially people, if anyone's been a business owner for a while, this issue probably has come up. You've seen it, you know, like before COVID, you might have the partner who's showing up really early to pick up the, your employee. You know what I mean? You might have, you know, you've seen probably some part of this that makes you go, that's a little, you know, <laughs> not, you know, it's, I'm noticing something with this, you know, it, and, and I think that, um, you know, right now, um, you know, when, when people are, there's the economic stressors and then there's also, there was the ability for people to stay at home, which wasn't safe. Um, if any dy dynamics around domestic violence have, have really kind of settled in, in terms of coercion and control and isolation, um, now asking that person to come back to work, you know, is something that, that I think it's important to be mindful of, you know, it, that, that that might be something that does create stress um, for that survivor, they're going to have to be navigating it. I think it can sometimes be helpful um, when people are saying, okay, it's time to be coming back into the offices because now you're creating a venue where that person can, can get out of the home. But I think it's not always that simple, you know. Um, I think, you know, people naturally prior to this had a lot, had a, just all these built-in breaks from each other. If it was, you know, if it, you know, like it's school, everyone's going to work. Um, and so just spending all this time together, there's on top of the economic stress, on top of fear, you know, of, of, of getting something. I think also the other thing we're noticing is that many people sought shelter as um, a, either a break in their relationship or as a way to get out and make some changes. The idea right now of coming into a congregate setting where people, where you're gonna be interacting with other families, people are very nervous about making that decision. So I think the stressors they go in both ways. There's stressors for people who are causing harm, the economic insecurity, um, having everyone in your house, then not having everyone in your house and losing that sense of control, but then also stressors for the survivor when the help and resources that um, he or she were normally accessing have really not been as readily available. So it's just this perfect setup for this to get incredibly overwhelming for a family. Does that make sense the way I'm saying that? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, you know, just in, in thinking about what you were saying, you know, my head is like, wow, because you don't, you know, you, you said it perfect when you said we have built in, you know, a lot of us live a life. Most of us, I think if you're an eight to five or a working parent, eight hours or more away from the home, you have these built in safeguards without even realizing. Um, and whether it's domestic violence or just the stress, which leads to mental health stress, um, you know, the kids have activities after school. They are going to 
baseball and football and swimming and tennis or whatever activities extracurricular that they do. Um, there's so many different ways that we have those built in, you know, guards. And all of a sudden that was stripped away. I mean, all of a sudden, very stripped quickly stripped away, you know, you're, you're all of a sudden, um, you know, something that traditionally we haven't done for decades in this, in this community and, and in this world is, you know, you're eating three meals together. You're uh, studying and learning together on the internet. You're trying to share a computer. You're trying to schedule things out if not everybody has their own equipment in the in the home. Um, I mean, so there is these this amount of stress and I, the way I have been looking at it and the way that I've been talking with people about it is, you know, prioritizing, making sure that somebody's in charge as a family leader, if you will, but prioritizing you know, what, what time of day we do things and what time of day, you know, who, who gets what. And, and sometimes you need it to be quiet, but you're in a, a house where there's only two rooms, you know, you've got a big open space and a bedroom. And, and if you need quiet on the, on the, on the, on the set, if you will, because you're, you have to do work and then the student needs to study. And so it's all these new ways that we're trying to live together and learn together and be a cohesive family or team, you know, if you're at home with roommates, whatever that may be, because that can be stressful in itself, you know, you got everybody to work and go to school at the same time, it's, it's insane, and so um, I think that that's something that we all need to be really aware of, is cognizant of, of whose time at times needs that space and that time, um, and, and that alone can stress people out, because I know sometimes I'm like, ah, ah there's a lot of noise. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where to, to focus. And so I can't imagine having three kids at home and, and a husband and a wife that are working from home and grandmother that is there cooking three meals a day, taking care of the kids while they're running around screaming. So again, we say those things to let everybody know it's normal. This is, this is not something we've ever dealt with before, but it is a part of, of the new life. And I know people hate that term, the new normal, but it really is the new normal. Um, there's going to be parents that aren't going to be going back to work. There's parents that are going to be staying home to homeschool or whatever their decisions may be. And even that is. So the importance of taking care of yourself physically and mentally is huge. So let's talk about that for a minute, Rachel. You know, you guys... Um, <laughs> you are really dealing with one very specific, um, very tough issue to deal with in, 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 in talking with domestic violence. But if we're talking about mental health in general, what are some of the ways that people can be mentally healthy? What are some of the things that they can do to de-stress and kind of focus on taking care of themselves to try to be um, better people in, in this community we're living in. I know that's- like so that. We all need a good hug like that. <laughs> Kids are like, oh my God, so sweet. <laughs> Being at home, it's like, these are my little coworkers. <laughs> no, we all need, I mean, I think that was well-timed, right? But at the same time, think about it. I mean, there's times you're on Zoom calls with really like, big community leaders and their, their kids come running in dad or mom, I'm thirsty or, you know, or the dogs are barking or the doorbell's ringing. And it's, you know, I find it kind of amusing because it's life. You know, we've never dealt with that when you're in a conference room, there's no interruptions, you know, phones off and here it's like, you know, everything's happening, multitasking. So uh, Rachel, tell us a little bit about ways that you guys have, have uh, or that you talk about or ways that you've discovered that people can just kind of mentally take a deep breath and kind of de-stress. What are some of those ways? Well, a couple of things come to mind really quickly, you know, is I think one of the things is to get outside when you can, you know, as much as possible. There's nothing better and more regulating for us than having, you know, some air, um, and some time outside. And if you, and it's, it, it really is, you know, um, being identified as a, as, a, as, a, as a really safe way for us to have some social connection while we're doing this physical distancing. You know, if, if people are still engaging in those practices, um, you know, I think that that can be really helpful is to get outside as much as possible. The news is a constant cycle right now. So I think also picking your dose that feels healthy, you know, like that is a really healthy way to do that. Um, someone will let you know if something really terrible has happened, <laughs> you'll find out. <laughs> so I think we don't have to stay glued to those screens. You know what I mean? Like, I think like, like, like taking, if we feel like we want to do it in the morning, middle of the day and in the afternoon or whatever the dosage that feels appropriate for you without it feeling this, like, you know, like this just black hole, you know, cause there's just so much. Um, and it's important to stay involved and to, to know what's going on, but we don't need that 24 hours a day, especially in our homes. I think that's 
I have to tell you, I'm so glad you said that because I was actually going to close up with, with positivity and, yes. and really trying to pick your battles. And when we say pick your battles, it's not always about argument. It's about picking your mental health battles. You know, it's hard to not turn on social media, you know, it, news, TV, internet, whatever it is that you're on um, and not hear negative or stress or violence or hate or whatever it is that is out there. And sometimes we have to be in control of our own space and we have to say, wait a minute, I'm not doing that today. Today, I need a, a happy mental health day. And, you know, one thing that has really worked for me is that, um, you know, COVID was not planned and it was in the middle of a remodel. And so I did not have internet during this time. And so talk about a struggle. <laughs> talk about your phone bill going to the roof from tethering, but that's another story. Um, but what has been amazing is I've missed so much. So I have to hear about it and then I go back and I do a little research. Um, but I did not have internet during the COVID three months, if you will. And, um, and, and so sometimes I feel like that kept me kind of a little bit healthy mentally and, and, and safe compared to some of the arguments that, that we visually see happening across social media platforms. Um, because man, that's a tough place to be to see that all the time. So I hope that everybody walks away with one thing today. It's kind of control how you intake media and what pieces are super important. I, we love here at the chamber to highlight the happy stuff. And we get it. We get that that stuff's happening all around us, but we really try to focus on the good things, you know, opening business, opening business healthy and safe, providing resources, which might include some mental health recovery and some mental health resources. And then of course, making sure they're safe. And those are the stories. We want to hear the good work that you guys are doing in the community. Those are the things that are the most important. So before we close up and before we um, you know, uh, uh, close up the webinar for the day. I really want to say, um, you know, again, we'll, we'll start with Rachel. We'll go back to you, but tell us what is, you know, we want to leave with something. Give us some nuggets of information. Tell us again how to get in touch with you. Tell us again, uh, you know, the importance of people connecting to what you guys do. And, and let's just talk a second about other organizations out there that maybe either you have not connected with or don't know are out there that want to connect with you. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of um, our website, New Mexico, nmcdv.org is always a great place just to go. You know, you're going to be able to link through different places. You have our phone number on there and you can absolutely just give us a call and we can figure it out. I think New Mexico, and probably anybody who's involved at this chamber, you're part of a group of people who figure stuff out, right? That's like that's, like that's, we can always that's figure it out. We're strong believers in that, you know? Um, and so, um, and we would want to connect you with your local program. And if that's even someone in another state, we can work to connect you, you know, someplace um, that can get those resources for you. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to remember what your other question was. Sorry. Yeah, you know, there's partners out there. As a matter of fact, I bring it up only because uh, when Teresa first came, uh, and I, I've been lucky to know Teresa for many, many years, but when we first started getting um, the um, uh, the coalition involved with the chamber, uh, you know, we looked at some possibilities of connections and, and there's connections out there that exist. And I think that sometimes they just don't know you guys exist. So what are some of those ways that we can, you know, connect? And then if they want to connect, how do they get in touch with you? Those are, thank you for that. That they are, that is really exciting because I think especially during these times, I mean, we need it all the time for the kind of work that we do. Um, but I think, you know, you know, restaurants, places that have, you know, food, leftover food, your local shelter could benefit from that. If there's training that a local, you know, domestic violence agency or that we could provide to your organization, you know, if that, if there's something about for leadership or management, or even the people that, you know, are providing the direct service or work that, you know, in your business, we could really, I think, mutually, you know, benefit for sure. I think, you know, in terms of, um, you know, we over throughout COVID developed a relationship with Lyft um, to be able to get um, people free rides from rural settings, you know, if they needed to get to, to different places. Um, you know, I was thinking when you were talking about ways to promote mental health, um, you know, people could start having lunches, um, you know, in their businesses and have Grubhub, you know, deliver something while they're all on there and sharing some time together. So um, the local, you know, business can benefit from that. And so I think that there's ways, um, there's, you know, I, when I was working with Community Against Violence, um, when people were moving into their transitional housing homes, 
Um, we would need people to help move people into those homes. When people were moving out, we were using local cleaning companies to help clean and those kinds of things. And so I think, um, again, if this conversation interests you, if this kind of work is interested, interesting to you in, in the community that you're in, there's absolutely a way for you to connect with either your local program um, or give us a call and we can help brainstorm what that might look like. Ter Teresa, am I leaving anything out in terms of um, anybody else that we would, I mean, I think we would want all of y'all to give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> Hit the nail on the head. And that's what's been, and that was really like, I'm glad you said that. Cause I, again, not knowing a hundred, I know a lot about the coalition, but not knowing a hundred percent about it and, and, and who, who really can come into, into the space. I mean, we're talking every industry under the sun in some way that you could partner, you could sponsor, you could support um, the coalition or the direct services in your area if you're outside of Albuquerque or wherever you may happen to be uh, because of the fact that there, there's a need. There's a need and every, every dime that they get sponsored or every dime that is saved by not having to spend is money that can be used towards the other uh, needs and, and, and resources that they can provide, which are the absolute front needs of what needs to be provided. And so thank you for bringing that up, Rachel, because that's so important. And we're going to work really, really hard here at the Chamber to connect. We've done a few connections, but uh, we love working with Teresa to connect. So I think that that's super important. So Teresa, um, before we go again, just share with us. Um, I, I, and, you know, I want to just say this because you and I have been friends for many years, and I know how passionate you are about the community and how passionate you are about this topic in particular. And I know that for a fact, the day that you got the call uh, to come to work for the coalition you literally were outside your body i think you had an out-of-body experience and the first thing you said to me was i have found my dream job this is what i was meant to do this is what i want to do this is where i feel good about what i'm doing and recently you and i had a conversation where you said I still feel the same way. If not, I'm more impassioned now because now I actually know the work and now I'm actually working. So share with us a little bit about why this um, position that you have taken on over this past year or almost year um, has been for you and, and what it means to you to be working with the coalition and in the community. Well, you know, just piggybacking off Rachel, my boss, which is, I'm, I'm so blessed, by the way, to have Rachel as my boss, like her and I, like everything she just said right now about how we can collaborate with the community, like her and I are just like, we see exactly what, it's like mental telepathy, right? Like she just knows and we work so well together and I'm so blessed to be working with her and same with my, with the other staff, like we just mesh so well. Um, it's an amazing group of people. Our director is amazing. Our staff is amazing. I'm super blessed. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Like I was in pharmacy for 10 years. And so, um, you know, advocated for myself for what, five years now. And then I, this opportunity came across and I applied and here I am. And I'm just, I'm really happy to be a part of the coalition because it, it just, it's very fulfilling to be able to provide um, services and get to know what's really happening um, and getting into the weeds with it and having staff members to support you and doing all the legislative work with them, um, with our director and with Rachel now coming in and our other staff member, Teresa and Gwen um, and our office, like we just have an amazing staff and it's just been a blessing to be a part of them to be able to wake up every day and know that you're creating some type of change, um, whether with it's, you know, within the organizations or it's, you know, with training the advocates and then with the training that they receive, they can better serve their clients. Um, and just being there as a support system. And like Rachel said, we really wanna build relationships with the community on how um, we can you know, support each other, what we can do together, projects, events, um, trainings. If your staff needs any type of trainings, like the telehealth training, how to make decisions in critical times, um, you know, how to prevent burnout or, you know, if there's like a particular subject that your, that your um, small business would like to talk about, like how to notice the signs of domestic violence, DV 101, um, children. I mean, anything that we can provide and create a relationship with, with you guys in general and even for organizations with donations, with creating drives, with creating, you know, um, giving them resources or like Rachel said, you know, if if there's a restaurant that has extra food at the end of the day that is non-perishable, please consider donating to one of our organizations. Um, it's 
they do amazing work and they are the true heroes. And um, I'm just, I'm just really happy every day to wake up and be working with what I'm doing <laughs> and who I'm working with. And um, yeah, I'm in complete bliss every day. <laughs> second that because I talk to her pretty much every day and so I know how much she loves the work so I just want to recap today guys we, we've had a, a great webinar if you tuned in late or missed out and, and and you're just tuning in you can find this entire webinar at our website www.ahcnm.org and we'll share the link with you guys as well so if you'd like to share it or post it you have that available to you as well or share it with your staff anything um, you'd like to do with that so um, I would like to just do a little recap what we've learned today you know we've been blessed to be um, uh, had this last hour to spend with uh, Rachel and Teresa, who are with the um, New Mexico Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Uh, today, we, we, we spoke a little bit uh, about mental health and the importance of that mental health. And I think some of the takeaways for today are really do the best that you can to keep yourself healthy, mentally healthy in your space. You know, that might be getting outside, that might be exercising, that might be meditating, it might be eating healthy, it might be, you know, uh, figuring out a schedule in your home so that you can work as a cohesive team when you have a full house and you're staying at home or you're going to be working from home now. Um, but you have to make sure that you give yourself enough permission to, to be healthy because that is a huge issue right now. Um, also, you've got to visit the website. That's the big one nmcadv.org. I'm sure it's posted somewhere in this link. I just said it again. We said it throughout the day because it's not just about the domestic violence, guys. There's so many other resources that they offer. As a matter of fact, Teresa, I would love to talk with you about possibly doing a class for small business owners. We'll invite them in on a Zoom and you guys could do some training about seeing the signs. I know that people are starting to come back to work, come in out of their, their home spaces that they've been in. I think it would be really great that business owners recognize those signs and it'd be be able to know the appropriate way to approach their employee and tackle those very sensitive issues. So we will work to do that as well here at the chamber. So it's been a great hour, guys. We're super excited. Uh, our next webinar is scheduled for next Monday, the last Monday of June already. Can you believe it? Like 4th of July is like a week away. That's insane. I'm, I, I just, I can't believe how fast this year has gone. Um, but with that being said, we here at the Hispano Chamber, we're so excited to see our we're excited to help you guys develop that, share what you're doing in the community as much as possible. Please reach out to us. You can call us here at 505-842-9003. We check the messages all day long, literally. Um, and, and we just want to work with you and help you uh, get your business uh, reopened because we're here to open together. You guys have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon and we will see you all next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.